Hi, I'm James Harper, and today we're going to talk about platelets and endothelium and how they work in the clotting system. So our objectives today are to define the difference between a primary and hemostatic disorder and a secondary hemostatic disorder. And we're going to talk about the basic aspects of coagulation relating to endothelium, platelet, cell wall, uh, membrane interactions, and then also to describe von Willebrand factor biology and the clinical picture caused by its deficiency. And in later videos, we'll talk about its treatment. And the review today then is, coagulation takes place the site of a breach in a vessel wall. Tissue factors expressed from subendothelial tissues it combines with activated circulating factor eight, factor seven A, excuse me, and the activated seven A and tissue factor activates nine and activates ten and initiates the clotting cascade. Um, the vitamin K dependent factors bind to negatively charged phospholipids and membrane through their interactions. The uh, resulting production of fibrin is a cement that glues platelets together and produces a clot that's waterproof in the sense that um, fluids don't leak out from the vessel into the surrounding tissue, although there is water in the clot. Um, so again, our endothelial cells are studded with thrombomodulin and they're generally at rest coagulation neutral. Surface lipids are neutral or positively charged or and negatively charged phospholipids are moved to the inner leaflet um, in ATP dependent processes. Integrins um, and other adhesion molecules, as well as von Willebrand factors, are expressed during activation, and phospholoserine is expressed on the surface of platelets and endothelium in, and involved red blood cells. And this is an important thing to remember. Not only is this, drug, this phospholipid a trigger in the clotting system, to trigger an apoptosis. And so this is a trigger for both the clotting system and the inflammatory or the healing system um, to come in and start getting rid of dead cells. So a primary defect are those that prevent clotting from starting in the first place. For example, people who have thrombocytopenia simply can't make a clot. They're Clinical presentation are bruises and petechiae, bruises on the surface of the body. A secondary defect is one that prevents the clot from becoming stable. An example of that is hemophilia. Um, another example of this would be factor 13 deficiency, in which fibrin gets made, but it never gets cross linked, so it's never strong enough to be stable against destruction of the clot. In hemophilia, uh, as we mentioned, the thrombin burst is so slow that the fibrin production is very slow and the clot is soft and not structurally uh, sound and not really waterproof in terms of preventing bleeding or fluids from the blood vessels leaking into the surrounding tissues. So a primary defect prevents you from starting a clot and a secondary defect prevents you from staying clotted. Platelets are produced um, by the megakaryocytes in the bone marrow, and they're normally round and they're normally deactivated, they're turned off. Once they receive a signal to activate, they undergo a shape change and become more of a stellate um, picture or image. They express coagulation factors and coagulation active phospholipids on our outer membrane, and they secrete um, second messengers stored in granules inside them. They uh, ones that are most um, uh, commonly encountered clinically are ADP and serotonin. Um, platelets are uh, circulating in normal numbers from the time of birth uh, and hover between 150,000 and 450,000. Some terms regarding platelets. A deficient number is called thrombocytopenia. An excessive number is called thrombocytosis, and a platelet defect in terms of function is called a thrombocytopathy. 
normocytosis is elevation of platelet numbers. And in children and in most healthy adults, the most common causes of thrombocytosis are acute inflammation and iron deficiency. Essential thrombocytosis is a myelodysplastic syndrome, which occurs in adults and to some extent children, um, but it's extremely rare in children and rare in adults. Iron deficiency is a common cause of this, uh, and it causes thrombocytosis because of cross-reactivity between erythropoietin and thrombopoietin. And basically this little um, diagram explains it. Iron deficiency causes anemia. Anemia causes decreased oxygen carrying capacity, which causes increased erythropoietin production. Erythropoietin cross-reacts with thrombopoietin receptors and causes an uh, unintended increase in platelet numbers. Platelet function defects can be um, congenital or acquired. You can have defects in adhesion. You can have defects in the granules and how many, what granules you have to secrete and whether or not the granules are secreted appropriately. Examples of adhesion defect are bernard soulier syndrome, in which the platelets don't adhere to von Willebrand's factor normally. Defect in granules, the gray platelet syndrome, in which one whole type of granule is simply not present, and the platelets have a gray color to them. Um, defect in response to second messengers, and this is an example, Glanzmann's thrombocytopenia, or excuse me, Glanzmann's thrombostenia. Um, and Glanzmann's is a uh, condition in which the platelets are largely um, uh, deaf, if you will. They simply can't respond to the signals given to them because they can't, they don't have the receptors um, functioning. Acquired platelet defects include medications, the antiplatelet drugs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, um, aspirin being a classic example, um, Paxil and other SSRIs that are um, capable of in inhibiting platelet function, and then systemic illness, renal failure with elevation of BUN, liver failure with elevation of lipids. And liver failure is always a complicated uh, coagulation issue because the coagulation system is abnormal, the anticoagulation system is abnormal, and the uh, platelets are abnormal. So the picture there is oftentimes quite muddy. Von Willebrand factor. Von Willebrand factor's manufactured endothelium has a half-life of between 8 and 12 hours. And... It is a rather important thing in that its function is to stabilize factor VIII, which by its nature is not particularly stable, um, and also to bind platelets into thelium. Um, it's bound to glycoprotein 1b on the surface of platelets. People with bernard soulier syndrome have a mutation or a defect in this receptor so they're unable to bind von Willebrand factor. It's stored in endothelium in a, a structure called a Weibel Pilati body. And it exists in very high molecular weight multimers that are cut apart by a metalloproteinase called Adams TS13. And this um, uh, wrench picture here is a reminder of the metaphors. This is a multiple multimer that's huge. And without the effect of the atom 13, the huge molecular weight multimer is released uncut. And then it becomes a problem because it binds platelets excessively and causes clot uh, and bleeding. Um, and uh, we'll have more discussion on um, that condition in other videos. Um, the uh, binding of these multimers to atom 13 is dependent on a receptor, and when a mutation of that receptor occurs, a form of the von Willebrand's disease called type 2b von Willebrand's occurs. Uh, and again, that's a discussion for later. 
So von Willebrand factor binds plates into thelium. Plates bind von Willebrand's uh, that are not to hooking Newton into thelium and will bind to each other. Plates will bind to fibrin as well. And basically the, the function of von Willebrand's and the function of the fibrin is to hold the platelets to each other and to the wall of the vessel. The platelets have um, actomycin and are able to contract. And so the, the clot overall, because of all the platelets contracting, contracts, becomes tighter against the vessel wall. Absent fibrin binding to platelets, absent von Willebrand's binding to platelets, the platelets contract and tear the clot apart. Okay, so von Willebrand disease, and this is frequently abbreviated VWD, is a deficiency of platelets binding to endothelium, produces weak porous clots, and is a primary hemostatic defect. Um, it's coded for on chromosome 12 as an inherited in an autosomal manner. There are basically three types of the defect. Type 1 is a simple deficiency and is most common. Type 2 is a point mutation with loss of function usually, but sometimes gain of function mutations. And type 3 is a complete absence of the factor. Type 2 von Willebrand's disease um, is usually a loss of function mutation. Type 2A is the most common, and this is a loss of adhesion effectiveness. In other words, it can't bind to the platelet. Type 2M is a loss of adhesion to the glycoprotein 1B, um, a complete loss. Type 2N is a loss of the binding site for factor 8, and this produces a, a hemophilia picture that's inherited in an autosomal manner. Type 2B is the loss of binding site for the Adams TS13, as we mentioned. And type 2B is the most clinically challenging of the group because the treatments we use for type 1, the common form, and for type 2A actually make things worse. So one has to always be cognizant of type 2B um, uh, and um, make its diagnosis and make sure it's clearly documented in the medical record for the future. Type 1 von Willebrand disease, um, most common. Approximately 1% of the population has it. Um, a deficiency of a normal functioning von Willebrand factor. And then the clinical picture depends on the a degree of acute inflammation and emphasis again on acute because mild cold, mild allergies will change the level of this, drug, this chemical quite a bit, a lot. Uh, and then women who are post puberty, um, uh, the level of estrogen. Uh, as you have learned, estrogen levels cycle through uh, the menstrual phase and von Willebrand's uh, parallels the estrogen level. So von Willebrand factors highest mid-cycle and is lowest at the beginning of menses. Um, the clinical picture, bruises, nosebleeds, bleeding with dental work, menorrhagia, I put menorrhagia in bold and underline it, and this is important. Oftentimes in family histories, this is the only symptom that's noted, and this may be the only symptom noted in the HMP. So it's important when you think about your OBGYN clinic or your family medicine patients who present with menorrhagia to think about von Willebrand's. Um, and when you think about the original kindred um, described by Dr. Eric von Willebrand, describe the condition. The only women who died of the disease, of von Willebrand's disease and his kindred, died either of, of menstrual bleeding or childbirth. Um, so this is a common problem and it's often overlooked. So be aware of it. Postpartum hemorrhage. All women have bleeding postpartum, but most women stop bleeding relatively on schedule a couple of days. These women will have excessive bleeding. And the reason that is, is that the von Willebrand level is 
parallel to your estrogen level. Throughout the course of pregnancy, estrogen levels rise quite high. The von Willebrand does as well. And then within about eight hours, the, von, the estrogen levels drop precipitously, as does the von Willebrand factor. And so the woman who has von Willebrand's, whose bruising got better all the way through pregnancy, suddenly now has no von Willebrand factor and is bleeding. So one has to be cognizant of that phase of bleeding in women with von Willebrand's postpartum. All right. So we're going to talk about the treatment of von Willebrand's in later videos. And I want you to go ahead and look at some review questions now. And again, if you want to think about the question, pause your YouTube player and then push play after you've selected your answer. Um, go ahead and use lab reference manuals for normal lab values if you need. All right. Question one. 17 year old girl presents to the OBGYN for heavy periods. Her menses last five days, occur regularly every 28 days, and her periods are very heavy. She uses five to six pads per day and often has to use both pads and tampons. Which of the following sets of labs would best support a diagnosis of von Willebrand's disease? And the answer is D. And let's explain. Option A is normal, 12 and 29. Option B are both prolonged, prothrombin time and parthromoplastin time. And that's going to be the result you would have in a multiple factor deficiency, such as liver failure. And it would be the result you would have in factor 10 deficiency or, pro, or uh, prothrombin deficiency. Factor 8 is a, or, or option E is foreshortened, the term used for, short, for faster than normal. And uh, option D is a prolongation of the PTT. Von Willebrand's job is to hold platelets to the vessel wall and to stabilize factor 8. And so if von Willebrand factor is low, factor 8 level is low because factor 8 is unstable without von Willebrand factor. And therefore, the prolongation of the PTT is noted. Let's move on. Question 2. A 40-year-old woman feels dizzy and has a sudden onset of headache and blurry vision. She's taken to the emergency department where she's found to be febrile to 101 to have variable levels of consciousness. She's kind of in and out, and she's got blood in her urine. Her platelet count's 30,000. Her PT and PTT are prolonged. Out of the following, which is most likely? A, a congenital deficiency of von Willebrand factor. B, a congenital mutation of von Willebrand factor. C, an acquired inhibition. And D, autoimmune thrombocytopenia. And E, congenital deficiency of Adams TS13. I will let you think about that for a second. Okay. The picture you've been given in this question is a classic presentation of the disease thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, or TTP. This is a, uh, oftentimes a viral-associated illness in which uh, people will have an antibody rise to the virus, which interferes with the metalloproteinase function of the Adams TS13 but, uh, enzyme. The antibody causes the high von Willebrand multimers to come out. The inflammation causes a lot of them to come out, and that causes uh, small clots to form in the brain, causing alteration in mental status causes the low platelets because the big multimers of von Willebrand factor bind heavily to platelets and they're cleared. And it causes um, blood in the urine because of clotting in the small vessels in the kidney, which cause um, bleeding around them. So this is a, uh, a classic presentation of TTP, which is caused by inhibition of the Adams TS13 by uh, uh, 
antibody. Okay, question three. How would you explain the difference between a primary hemostatic disorder and a secondary hemostatic disorder in terms of mechanism of bleeding and clinical presentation? Primary hemostatic disorders are those involved in initiation of the clotting mechanism. They present with bruises on the surface of the body and bleeding on the surface, not on the um, structural members of the body internally. Secondary hemostatic disorders are those involved in later steps in the process, and they present with deep tissue bleeding and joint bleeding due to the formation of weak porous clots example, hemophilia. The primary difference between the two is that a hemophilic can make a blood clot stop. So a small bus blood vessel on the surface that's under no tension clots off normally. But a vessel in a muscle or a vessel in a joint uh, or a hollow structure that has no um, support in the hollow structure case or is under a lot of mechanical uh, tension because of the muscle or the joint has the clot tear loose and because the clot's not very strong to start with it tears loose more more easily than normal resulting in more bleeding in the uh, site um, okay well this is the end of this video if you have any questions 